has been collected for a number of years. Uh, and initially they thought that they had a northern population and a southern population. Okay, and you can see there that um, they collected all of the, uh, the males and females. They didn't know much about its um, uh, life cycle, and we'll be doing that in, a, in looking at that in a moment. But you can see how similar um, what is going to turn out to be two species of butterfly can be. Okay, so the southern population there, um, as we're going to see, is going to be Celestia, and the northern population is going to retain the old name, the Gyrus anoni. Okay. Um, the, uh, it's interesting, um, a, a guy uh, that was uh, prominent in, in this work was a guy named the Queen, and he lived in the Milmeran area, which is sort of, you can see that cluster of light blue spots in the bottom part of Queensland there, it's sort of in the middle. And he reckons, he, he, he lived there for 25 years, and he thought that in 25 years he'd only seen 25 years. So, and then of course that doesn't include catching. So that, he, had, he thought that it was a very, very difficult and rare butterfly. Now, the situation sort of remained like that. Um, <coughs> until 1972 when Common and Waterhouse produced their, um, I'm not sure the Waterhouse was still around, but Common, Common used Waterhouse's 1931 book and um, uh, developed the second edition, and he or they made comments on the fact that these two populations lived in wildly different ecological habitats. And we'll have a look at that in a moment, okay? In 1999, Eastwood and Fraser, again, in, this, in, a, in a paper, um, observed that not only did the two populations live in different ecological areas, but they used as their obligatory act two wildly different ants. Okay, we'll have a look at those ants in a moment. Uh, the ants aren't even in the same tribe, so that they're, they're wild, widely separated, the two ants, okay? Yes, please. Okay, now, um, this is all just the intro, we'll get on to the pretty pictures in a moment. But um, Michael Brady, a friend of mine, who I've known for years and years and years, uh, is now working in Annick. He's actually retired, but he's an honorary in Annick. We make the butterfly work, he still does. It's astronomical. But anyway, um, he had done some preliminary mitochondrial genetic work. We talked about mitoCO1 a little bit in the past. I'm not going to bore you with that again. I, I won't revisit that topic. Um, and the little bit of genetic work had, done, had, had been done suggested that these two populations were in fact different. So he decided that he would grasp the nettle totally and he would investigate the problem more thoroughly. Um, he had an honours degree student working for him, and interestingly, the honours degree student uh, lived in South Australia for many, many years, um, and worked with me on my moths in, in the museum that soon won't be, okay, and together, since 19, uh, 2021, they produced three really groundbreaking papers on the gyrus alone. Um, Anyway, I was lucky enough to be invited. I must admit, I sort of said, well, please take me. Um, I'll be the cook. Uh, uh, but anyway, I went along, and it was a great trip, OK? Um, we had 10 weeks, 10 week trip. Um, we were going to go right up to the top of um, Cape York, but we didn't get there. But we were all knackered enough at the end of it anyway. So we got the five. Um, types of butterfly that we were looking for. So that was good. Um, the results of the trip were the erection of um, two new species of the virus. We're only going to be talking about one of those, but um, I'll show you 
at least a, a genetic tree with the other one in, in a moment. And um, they, we got the complete history of <coughs> the guy with Celestina. Okay, so um, this is a genetic tree. To, it's, um, to get this one, they looked at two mitochondrial enzyme, uh, uh, genes, um, MitoCO1 and MitoCO2, okay, which is about 1,200 base pairs. Um, when I do my work, I only work with one of those, and I work with about 600 base pairs. So the bigger the piece of DNA, the, the more likely you are to, to get a better result. Now, the result there, I'm, if you look at the colour legend, you'll get some idea there. You can see that the pink and the blue are quite well separated. Um, this bar down the bottom here, you can see the bar right down the far bottom, um, that's 3%. And to work out how, how different um, one thing is from another, what you do is you actually measure the lengths of these lines. You measure the length of the line back to the um, uh, horizontal line and then the length to the, to the new or to the, the second thing you want to look at. So you add the distances. <coughs> and 2 to 3% is usually considered um, good. Okay? So you can see there that we've got a separation of Celestia and Anoni, which is the pink one. And then the other um, agaris that we were looking for was Ephus, which was the, um, uh, what's Ephus called? <coughs> Bianthus is the Sydney Asia. I'm just trying to think of the common name for Ethus. It will come to me. Eventually. No. That's the one that lives. Ethus actually had two populations. One was in the, the northern part of the Northern Territory, and one was right at the top of Cape York. So the populations were separated by the Gulf of Carpentaria. And what the authors have done here is they have separated out, uh, they said that they're two species as well. And if you look at the little green square there, that is the Northern Territory population, which has been raised to full species, and now is called the virus Donnelly. Next, please. Okay, so let's have a look at Celestia. Right, species has an obligatory ant relationship with an arboreal ant. These ants only live in trees. I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. And this is Anacomyra uh, inclinata there, and I've got the best picture of the ant that I can get. They're not big, and um, the interesting thing is when they get angry, they're only, they're only about that big. You can see a couple of millimetres. They stick their um, abdomen up in the air at 90 degrees to the body, so you can tell that they're a bit upset. Okay? Um, the ants protect the caterpillars as they hide and feed. Um, and the ants, of course, get nutrients from the caterpillars, and so it's a, it's a good relationship. Um, very, very interesting, these ants don't like going on the ground. And sometimes you'd find them, and um, there'd be these huge streams of ants just over they make sure that they didn't hit the ground. They go over here to a, a stump and then there'd be a log here and then they'd come back here and back here and then eventually they'd go to the tree where they, where they had their nest. Um, very intriguing. Okay, now the caterpillars use one of those three mistletoes, um, Ami and Linophila. Very interesting. Um, very pretty uh, mistletoe actually. Lysiana exocarpi and Amine maquillii. Now, intriguingly, we get all three of those in South Australia. Okay? And maquillii um, is a very, very commonly used one by a wide range of agaria species. Next, please. Okay, so let's have a look at the life cycle of Celestina there. Um, so, we've got the egg. First in star, second in star, third, fourth, fifth, and then it goes to the pupil stage. And um, what the caterpillars do is between the instars they shed their skin, blow themselves up with a bit of air, and 
sort of grow into their new skin. Okay, so that's how they increase their size. And uh, there we have a male there with the, um, um, unfortunately, the gyrus, when they land, they don't open their wings. They'll often sit there and circle their wings like that. And if you're lucky enough, you can get a picture of the other side. But, um, uh, and the bottom picture there you can see is a caterpillar being attended by, um, by ants. Okay. So we caught adults, uh, we found eggs, we found caterpillars, and um, uh, <coughs> uh, Brady and Beaver mm. raised these um, back in the laboratory. They got quite a nice collection of new, new butterflies. Okay, next please. Okay, now this butterfly lives principally in Brigalow Woodland um, and they fly high through the canopy so it's not surprising that they hadn't been seen um, much of, okay. And there's Brigalow there. Um, we'll go a little bit more into Brigalow but um, Brigalow is the, uh, a common name given to a species of acacia. And so the acacia was the dominant plant. But um, intriguingly, the Amina linophila uh, lived on the bull oaks. And you can see bull oaks in that picture there. Okay? And we'll talk more about them later. But mm. the, the leaves of linophila, linophila um, line um, leaves, that's really what it means, straight leaves. Um, look almost exactly the same as the bull oak leaves. So they try to hide. You'll get some pictures of that later on. Okay, let's go and have a look at the, the northern one, uh, Agaris anoni. Could you just go back there again for a little bit? Okay, now you can see that the ant is significantly different. All right, Thelidris cordatus. Um, now, uh, this ant likes living in swamp melaleucans, okay? But, interestingly, it prefers to live in what's called an ant plant. It's an epiphytic uh, plant, which actually lives on the melaleucans. So, I'll show you a picture of those later on, but they, they much prefer living in there. Okay, so they live in the, in the ant plant, um, but they'll look after the caterpillars that are on the, the host tree. Alright. Um, right. Um, now, the uh, uh, Mr. Tarfiton is Dendrophy vitellina, and we'll have a look at that next. So. Alright, so very pretty mistletoe, big sprays of yellow or orangey flowers. Okay. Um, uh, most unpleasant ant, okay? I mean, they just crawl all over you, they bite you. It's a horrendous thing to They're not very big, but there are just thousands of them. Well, there's the green ants that live in the No, no. Places. Oh, well, yes, the green ants, well, yes. The green ants live in something like that. Too. Oh, but these aren't No, no. Okay. Green oh, ants tend to live in a, in a yeah. accumulation of leaves which they've tied together. This is actually a plant which the ants live in. And you can see um, the ant plant there. It's got its own leaves. It only uses the swamp um, melaleuca for, as an anchoring point. Um, and uh, what you can actually do is take one of these plants and take it home and anchor it onto your water in your home. And the ants, of course, because they live in it, go with it. And um, you've got to be a little careful that people are doing this too much and so they're actually being lost from the environment. But a friend of mine, a um, good friend, what he does is he takes these and he puts them in the trees in Port Douglas. Okay? And then the butterflies find the ants. And, and so you've got these butterflies flying around the suburban trees in, in Port Douglas. It's close to there. So the ant, the ant plants can be very, very useful. Okay, next. Okay, and that's typical swamp melaleuca habitat. Um, 
damp, wet creeks running through it. And we spent ages there because one of the things we did was to put some uh, corrugated and cardboard bands around the trees. And when the caterpillars are moving around, they find these, uh, the corrugations. And because it's a nice place to hide, they tend to stay there. And I often thought that the work we were doing was actually increasing the population. You know, because more will survive there. And they'll even pupate in these in these bands. I didn't see the results of I, I was the guy who, well, I carried half the land around, and then I stood with my foot on the bottom as the other two ran up and down. Okay, because I was the old the oldest one there. Okay. Uh, Ethan did most of the uh, sort of work in the tops of the trees because he wasn't yet twenty. So okay, um, so that's typical. Uh, Gorosanini habitat, and that's actually just outside of Carpet. Next mess. Okay, and um, here is the life cycle of that butterfly. Again, green egg rather than orange, you can see. Uh, and there are lots and lots of differences in the caterpillars. It doesn't look as though there are, but there are, there are plenty, okay? Um, uh, they pupate under loose bark on the tree. They don't pupate in the ant plants. Uh, they, they stay on the tree or near the um, uh, near the mistletoe. And the bottom right there, you can see that caterpillar being um, uh, looked after by one of the ants. I just point out in the top centre photo there, you can see the. Um, uh, olfactory glands. The, the, the way these stop the ants eating them is that they pump out a pheromone that is identical to the ant's pheromone. So the ant rushes up to this lovely, juicy looking object and gets the whiff of the pheromone and thinks, oh, it's one of us. And so it looks after it rather than eating it. Very useful. Very useful. No rewards. Oh yeah, yeah, they get rewards. Um, you can see um, the anal glands are a little bit difficult to see in these, but yes, that produces the um, secretion, honey dewy type secretion, which contains sugars and protein. Okay, next one is Okay, now, um, after close examination, I, must, I did none of this work, but Beaver and Brady found 14 external morphological differences between Celestia and Anone. So they went over with a fine tooth comb and they found 14 differences in the way they look. And they also found, and this is quite important, they found six differences in the male genitalia. Now uh, most of you have heard me rave on about genitalia so I've cut down my raving a little. Um, all that I will say is that um, in insects, genitalia are considered a key indicator of speciation. So if you've got two genitalia and they're different, you should start thinking that they're different species. Okay? The, the, the big question for taxonomists is, is there enough difference? How much, how much difference is there? And that's where the genetics really comes in handy. Okay? So you can say, is this little increase in the size of this tooth here enough? And if the genetics support that, you say yes. And, uh, so anyway, so genetics is great. Um, but also remember that um, not only were there differences in structure, but there were ecological and genetic differences. So they were very confident that they um, had two species here. Um, now we can look at a little bit, got to put some genitalia up, otherwise it <laughs> just wouldn't be right, you know. No, okay, um, now, um, no, I, I won't go into them too much, I don't think. These are male genitalia, um, but you can see the difference in, sh have we got the little pointer? Yeah. It has to be right into the thing. And oh, right, don't worry. We do the Yeah, yeah. Okay, no. That's almost up to 
Yeah, yeah, there's error. No, that's right. Very nice. Okay, if um, I won't speak too long here, um, but I think all of you can see differences in the structure there on the left hand side. Um, the thing that looks like a grasping hand are actually the valve, and um, you can see that they're different shapes, two hands there. That's what the male grasps the female with. So. Looking like hands, it's quite convenient. We won't go any further than that. Um, uh, uh, next one along is a posterior shot. Um, you can see some differences there, and then there's a top shot and an under shot. Um, but there are six notable differences between. Celestia and Anoni. I think we'll leave it there and move on. Thank you. Okay, so let's talk about <coughs> habitat and conservation. Um, Rigolo is the common name for Acacia harpophila, and this is the dominant tree species. However, uh, in um, different ecological niches, there are different tree species. So, um, if you go to some Brigolo at point A, you may not find any uh, bull oaks. Um, if you go to point B, you bull oaks are present. So that, that's all that I'm trying to say there. Um, the, the name of the bull oak is Alacasurina luminae. Um, uh, in the areas that we visited, the tree most preferred by Abiema linophila, uh, and hence was critical for the presence of Celestina. Remember, Celestina lives on the mistletoe. Mistletoe needs a plant to parasitise, and that's the bull oak. Um, now, the big problem, or one of the major problems with Brigolo, is that fire will kill the trees. They do not recover from fire. And that's very, very important. For the continuation of um, when we get to another another butterfly, um, you know, one fire could wipe out the entire population. Okay, but we'll come to that in a moment. But I just want to emphasise that point. Next, please. Okay, that's a case here, half the filler, um, big tree. I mean, most of them are smaller than that, but nice big trees, grey foliage. Very attractive, nice place to, to hang around in Brigolo Scrub. Yep, next one, please. Okay, now that's um, Alcasurina uh, Lunani, uh, and there's um, a Linophila over there, over on the right there. Next, please. Okay, so what I've got is the, the ranges for. Um, um, now you can see Acacia Harp, a filler up top there, then Lumini, which we get uh, right down in South Australia, Amiemia linophila, which we get quite strongly in South Australia, as you can see. But the right hand one is the ant, and that's its entire range there. And so you can see that this butterfly is in entirely dependent on the ant. There are a lot of other places, theoretically, it could live. But because the ants is only found there, that's the only place that it can live. Okay, next place. Okay, um, the limiting factor for the distribution of the butterfly is the ant distribution. And, <laughs> in the present day, the activities in Homo sapiens. Um, unbelievably, 87% of the Brigolo woodland that was here when Europeans came has been removed. 87%. And what's even worse is that if you look up um, uh, tree felling around the world, I think it's number three. The third worst place for tree felling is South East Queensland. And I couldn't believe we went to Gundawindi, which is very close to those green dots there at the end. Thousands of acres, they were knocking down. Thousands of acres of, of, of bull oaks. Just unbelievable. Yeah. So, 
Anyway, um, so what's left is divided into islands of vegetation. Very, very little chance of the butterflies moving from one to the other. Okay, the largest is about 2,000 hectares. And um, as we say, fortunately, one of those islands contains the Gyro Celestia. Yep. Okay, now what we've that, um, now the map on the right shows the previous distribution of, uh, sorry, the left, uh, shows the previous distribution of the Rigolo woodland and of the ant. Notice how well they match. On the right hand side there, the um, light blue square is the amount of Rigolo, but that's where the remaining Rigolo is. <coughs> And the rest has all been lost. Okay. Any of the natural bodies? Yes, some of it is. But intriguingly, the most important bit isn't in the natural bone. Um, yes, next one, please. Okay, unfortunately, Brigolo Woodlands contains or contains some unique species. And um, for one, uh, for those bird watchers amongst you, this was the home of the Paradise Parrot. <coughs> and I'll just divert slightly here because I'm a bird watcher. So um, there are three, or there were three species of parrot that nested in termite mounds. And the Paradise Parrot is one of them, or was one of them. Um, the other two are the Golden Shoulder Parrot, which lives up in Cook Town, and the Hooded Parrot lives in the Northern Territory. But, um, so they, those parrots can only exist where the termite mounds are. So if you knock all the termite mounds down, you get rid of the parrot. And that's what happened with the parrot. <coughs> um, just a couple more words on parrotless parrot. They actually took a population to England. And the population in England lasted right up to World War II. And nobody knew knows what happens to it after that. So, um, yeah, anyway. Um, all right, uh, we've also, um, the dusky flying fox is not quite extinct, it's now reduced to one small island. Um, it's the only place, there's only one population of bridal male-tailed wallaby left. That's a really low species. And there are at least three species of butterfly that are threatened. And we're going to have a look at some of those in a moment. Um, Celeste Celestia. <coughs> and these other two are even more threatened. So let's have a look at this one. This, this really is a beautiful little butterfly. It's only a small butterfly, about that big. Um, this is Hypochrysops picciatus. And uh, you'll notice it's sitting on um, Alocasurina uh, lumini, uh, lumanii, sorry, um, leaf there. Okay, next one please. Okay, now intriguingly, this butterfly uses the same ant as the Celestia does. Okay? But this time the ant lives high up in the trees. And um, the, uh, it uses two, two tree species that are used by Celestia. Unfortunately, the needs of the caterpillars seem only to be met in very old trees. Now we just don't know why, but these caterpillars only chew the very outside epidermis of the leaves and, and the um, uh, places where the leaves come out of the, uh, of the branchlets. Okay? Apparently you need a microscope to see where these caterpillars are being chewed. So they've got a very, very special need. Okay, and the trees have got to be at least a hundred years old. And how do you get? Well, I mean, that's an amazing amount of time. I mean, some of these trees are three and four hundred years old. But remember, one fire. And um, Picciatus is only found in. The, if you read the latest paper, it says it might be found in two places, but it's really only found in one place. Not on, not on, not in a national park. 
okay? And the farmers there are helpful without being encouraged. They hate people coming and wanting to have a look and walking up and down the roads. So they really dislike them. And um, so, um, new evidence is suggesting, and this has never been seen before, that they might be able to live on saplings. So that might just give us a small hope. But at present, this is Australia's most endangered butterfly. It lives in one place. Okay. Um, with hypochrysops, they actually live in the ant nest with the ants. Okay, not like not like the agarus. They they live in the mistletoe and the ants look after them. But the hypochrysops actually live in the ant nests. Next one. This is Galminus eubulus, and this is a brigalow only butterfly. It only it, it, um, this one needs answers too, uh, ants as well. Um, this only lives on Acacia harbophila, the brigalow, and it's just been knocked down in droves. So every time you knock down one of those trees, you knock down potential habitat. This is a very rare butterfly. It's called the pale imperial blue. And if you know Enagoras, it's closely related to that. Yep. Um, well, I've got thought to feed. Um, that's pretty well known now. Uh, therefore, it's exclusive to the brigalow. Next one, please. And this is a butterfly. And this is rather interesting, actually. Um, I didn't put the distribution up, but I'll talk to you about it. This is Hypochrysops um, cyane, and uh, it's known as the cyane skipper. There's actually a population of it around Sydney. Okay, it used to be able. There used to be one spot in the northern beaches that I think every lepidopterist in Australia went to at two o'clock in the afternoon. And you'd see one or two flying around a single tree. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they're still there, but anyway. But there's a population of these up in that southeastern part of Queensland. <coughs> and um, it just lives in a different way there. Um, actually, if we go to the next slide. Um, okay, uncommon and rare. Um, I've talked about the um, population separation. It's not apparently brigalow dependent, um, but I just wonder, you know, because this is a, when you've got two populations separated, you start thinking about separate species. So, um, uh, uses ants in the same genus as those used by Celeste. No, it doesn't use the same ant, just the same genus. Okay, and then we're coming to the end here. And I, I tore it up whether to use Queensland government, but I thought, why not? Um, and I got the Wasp Queensland government is well aware of the dangers of these butterflies and much of its wildlife in general. It doesn't seem to be able to come up with a plan that satisfies business and looking after the animals and plants. Um, there's still massive clearing going on, particularly in the regions where Celestia and Picciatus hang on. Just ask the question why. Um, and I'm just going to last the story and then we'll have the end. Um, on this trip, we went up to a, a valley behind Paluma called Hidden Valley. And there's a, uh, there's a butterfly, butterfly there called uh, Jalmenus pseudoictinus. Very rare as well. Okay? Um, this was, Hidden Valley was the only place that. It was known from, but then they found another couple of sites. So, so that was good. But intriguingly, Hidden Valley is beautiful because it was—it's untouched. The time we went there in 2021, you're walking through the deep scrub, and there's cows in there, cows everywhere. And you know, so so now somebody is using that beautiful, you know, untouched scrub for for cows. Not so bloody cows for cows. Um, <laughs> If you drive down the road south from, from there, um, it's one of the development roads, you pass tens of thousands of acres 
I've cleared land. Right? There's the odd tree that's left. They're just there. Grass is growing. And you, you do this for tens and tens of kilometres. Why aren't they using those areas to run the cows? It just, it just bewilders me. It seems as though you can get a permit to clear land rather easily. And um, anyway. So I think the cows are trashed as you like. Well, I mean, cows are needed. Um, but they really do massive destruction to creek lines and things like that. They just bash them down, kill all the indigenous plants or the local plants. They're, um, uh, yeah. They don't mind running the cows in the field, but they just destroy the streamlines. Right. Thank you. Well, yes, I hope you enjoyed it anyway. So, uh, thank you. Thanks, Mike. I think uh, it's just fascinating, isn't it? Uh, we know a lot about Brazil and Bahia and the and the parklands, but then you suddenly this gives it a whole new dimension of different ants, different areas, different ecology um, systems, and. Uh, Biggest belief that they've just got so much down it with no, no regard for the natural environment. Thank you. Thank you.